you know, many elements of the left understand we are in the middle of a, they see it as a middle of a war in this country. They treat it accordingly. And I think many on the right have not woken up to the way in which we are in a kind of cold war in this country. And I don't use that word lightly. Mm -hmm. right? It's a war in two senses, right? One is the, the basic worldviews on e either side are, at this point, irreconcilable. Right. Right. Either you believe in merit or you believe in group quotas. Either you believe in free speech, you actually believe in free speech, or you believe in censorship. Either you believe that nations have borders or you don't. Either you believe in American exceptionalism. Yes, that these are the best darn ideals that have formed the backbone of a nation in human history, or you don't. You can't have both of those things at the same time. So is that, is that the magic of Trump that he just innately understands that? And then I guess my question with that would be if he becomes president again, I mean, it seems to me that you actually communicate some of that at, in a technical way better than he does. He kind of gets it at this level and you're getting it in a way that can be communicated I, further. I think is Trump, that something that interests you? I think Trump understood it at a gut instinct in 2015, 2016 better than anybody who's shown up on the scene of American politics or culture. And I think most people across this country, most everyday citizens get it in their gut instinct as well. And I think what Trump did is he provided a voice in a way that could actually have impact in a way that nobody had against the managerial machine. It wasn't against the radical left, just the radical mm -hmm. left. It was against the, the entire machine itself that over the years, over the decades, had frankly been exploited by both sides. Mm -hmm. And he was the best darn chance we have been given in a generation or more, possibly a century or more, to say, I'm going to bring a baseball bat and tear the thing down. Now, I think that one of the things I have appreciated about getting to know Donald Trump better in the last, even recent months, is that he's ambitious about learning from that first term to say, okay, Yes, we had a great first term, but what are we going to have learned about facing down that challenge of taking on a deep state that we're actually going to implement the second time around and go even further than we did in that first term? And so each of us has our own unique skill sets, right? Donald Trump has his unique skill sets. Yeah, I think it's a once in a century, you know, candidate and leader. And, you know, I think I have my own skill sets. You have your own skill sets. And so I think it's up to every one of us to look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, how are we going to use our own unique God-given talents to do what we believe is right for this country? And I, I believe that shutting down that machine, that's my passion. That's the calling for the next stage of my career and whatever I can do to revive those constitutional principles in this country, three branches of government, not four, shutting down the managerial machine, making sure the people we elect to run the government actually run the government. And even if it's not through the government and the private sector, do the same thing exercising or exorcising ourselves out of the ESG cancer that holds corporations hostage. I'm going to, that's, that's what I'm going to do in the next phase of my life. And we're going to see what shape that takes. So if you got the call to be VP, which clearly a lot of the base is into, I think you just answered the question. I'd be, I'd be honored to serve, <laughs> you know, this country in whatever way has maximal impact. I, I think that we can fall into a trap right now. And I see us kind of falling into it, looking at the poll numbers now and believing that, you know, oh, all's honky dory. Yeah. I don't think complacency is a strategy. I think that in some cases that's a trap to fall into. So would I be honored to serve this country and to serve in a second Trump administration? Yes, I would. But do I think that now's the time to talk about that? No, I don't. <laughs> I think now is a time to focus on actually delivering a victory that is far from a foregone conclusion. And I actually think this is going to be a really complicated year. I don't think this is going to be some linear path where it's going to be a front door good faith fight between Trump and Biden, and then somehow we have a a cleanly ordained winner. I think there's going to be a lot of twists and turns this year. And the left, you know, many elements of the left understand we are in the middle of a, they see it as, the middle of a war in this country. They treat it accordingly. And I think many on the right have not woken up to the way in which we are in a kind of cold war in this country. And I don't use that word lightly. Mm -hmm. It's a war in two senses, right? One is the, the basic worldviews on e either side are, at this point, irreconcilable. Right. Right. Either you believe in merit or you believe in group quotas. Either you believe in free speech, you actually believe in free speech, or you believe in censorship. Either you believe that nations have borders or you don't. Either you believe in American exceptionalism. Yes, that these are the best darn ideals that have formed the backbone of a nation in human history, or you don't. You can't have both of those things at the same time. That's, that's sort of 
litmus test number one that you're in what you would call a war, time mm-hmm. for actual choice. And the second is when one of those sides is now weaponizing the basic rules of the road and the financial system, the legal system, the judicial system, the conduct of the political system, even the electoral system. You look at the ballot removal attempts, et cetera. That's using force rather than free speech and open debate to settle a question. So if you have irreconcilable views and at least one of the sides is using force rather than debate to settle a difference, it, you know, it's not physical force, certainly not yet, and I, God forbid we ever get there, but it's force rather than debate. We're in a kind of lowercase w war in this country, and I do think that it's up to our side to not actually turn that into an American revolution in the 1776 sense, but the spirit of the American revolution to say that we're going to stand for those ideals like the as if the future of our kids' lives depends on it, because it does, actually. So, so with that in mind, I mean, if if you saw the states really going their own ways, and I, I actually don't talk about this a lot because I don't like giving energy to it, and I can see you're a little hesitant to, yeah, in I mean, a certain you respect. you want to speak things into existence. Right, yeah. So, I, and I'm very aware of that. However, I can tell you having, as you know, I lived in California, and I campaigned against Newsom, and I got audited by the state three days later. I'm now here in- Is that Houston. right? I didn't yeah, know that. Three, three days later, audited by the state. I put my house for sale that day. I was here in two months. Um, here I live in a very functional, uh, place with good infrastructure and safety and you squatters don't have rights. It's not a real thing. All of the stuff that you know is wrong with things. So if I saw it, well, I feel like it's happening no matter what, whether we speak it into existence, it already is happening. But if you, if you saw, even as it pertains to the border, let's say Texas, just doing what it has to do to protect the border and Florida helping as it could in the red States, like that is the baked into the code of the constitution and federalism and all that. So you, so I suspect you'd be okay with it, but it's not the, it's, it's not a the, tough it's, question. It's, it's not yeah. the way I want to see this country yeah. go. And, yeah. and I see us in a window and this is where, when I say we're in the middle of a war in this country, I'm using it thankfully still figuratively, right? right? And to use that as a wake up call to say that, okay, if that's where we're headed, we have to change course in order to be one nation again, e pluribus unum, from many one. I think that still exists. That possibility still exists in this country, but I don't think it's going to exist for much longer, right? If, if my kids are in high school before we get this right, then I think, I think we're done. Yeah. I, I don't think we have a country left. That's the window we're working within. And so first, put aside my presidential campaign. This has actually been a motivation of mine for the last several years, looking at some of my efforts in the private sector. One of the main causes I've taken on is taking on the ESG movement. Yeah. Okay. What's at stake there? Why, why, is so fo- why, why have I been obsessively focused about the politicization of corporate America? Part of it is I saw it land on my own former company, The Doorstep. I founded a biotech company. It was a multi-billion dollar company. I'm CEO, led it for seven years. And suddenly George Floyd dies and there's a demand that I make a statement on behalf of BLM. It's ridiculous, yeah. but actually there was, there, was, yeah. there, was a, there was real conflict around that. My refusal to do it led some prominent advisors from my company to step down, resign ceremoniously six months later. And I had to make a choice and I chose to step down and speak my mind freely. There was that point, an entire, you know, entire succession that was able to take the company to the next level. But part of why I focused on that is, you know, I I then started Strive, which is a company that's offering alternatives to BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard financial products that vote your shares for pro-profit principles, pro-capitalism principles, Mm -hmm. rather than pro-left-wing political principles. But why is that important, right? It's not just that those companies are going to be hopefully more valuable if they're focused on their mission rather than politics. That's what Milton Friedman would have appreciated, and I appreciate that as well, and that was the premise of Strive and its fiduciary focus. But it's also important in a different sense for reuniting the country, because even if we fight like hell in the realm of politics, if there are other spaces outside of politics that unite us, right? The sports stadiums of this country, I'm going to one right after this. The museums of this country, right? The companies where you go to work. Those other spaces are required for solidarity. And actually this has been true for America for all of our history. Alexis de Tocqueville was the first person to observe this. He traveled the country, he says, a diverse geographically expansive democracy that does not have a common ethnic heritage or a common national identity glue other than that civic idealism isn't meant to last. It's going to crumble in a generation or less. I mean, that's what Tocqueville believed unless, unless, and these are his words, there are intermediating or intermediary institutions. 
Capitalism is one of those intermediary institutions that you're bound not by black or white or red or blue, but by the common pursuit of excellence, of value creation that you share in and allows you to live a better life. Same thing with respect to hobby interests like sports Mm -hmm. or otherwise. But when those themselves get infected by politics, then I think we're done as a country. And so prior to running for president, that was a big part of my focus. But then you, you pull on the string and you ask, where are some of those forces coming from? The mother of all of the, a lot of those problems, if not all of them, come from a lot of the overreaches of a federal bureaucracy that has, for the reasons we talked about earlier, overgrown its use. And, you know, a lot of that ESG movement, for example, comes from regulations at the SEC, at the EPA, et cetera, that require companies to behave this way. But those were never passed by actually the elected representatives in the first place. Which is another reason why we're not united, because at least if the people who we elect to run the government are the ones that actually run the government, at least we can agree to disagree that the right person got elected or the wrong person got elected. But if that's not even the person making the decisions in the first place, then that feeds a lot of the division that then flows downstream. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.